was once a hugely thriving ecosystem. We couldn't have cleaned it out anymore had we tried. It would be mad to assume that towing a heavy metal dredge over any of these habitats wasn't going to have a degrading effect on it. It's kind of heartbreaking to think that my boys might live to see a time when the, the seas are barren or close to it. The smallest of the trawlers have been squeezed the hardest and have probably got the, the worst of, it, of all the fishermen. I think the problem doesn't so much lie with trawlers or dredgers, it lies with fisheries management. Imagine a limit around the whole of the coastline. It would just be a massive step forward. My dad is a fisherman and fishermen, no matter how they fish or where they fish, they're all going to be judged by history in the same light. It's just a breathtaking world, really. You step into the icy water, you submerge, and it's just a totally new world that opens up around you. There's kelp forests tangled in knots that ebb and flow with the tide. There's octopuses crawling around on the seabed. Do you know what? It's really scary how quickly these underwater worlds are being destroyed, along with the fish that depend on them. And most of the time, no one even knows that it's happening. I've been diving Loch Caron for 15, 16 years. And so I know the area, I know what sort of animals are here, and I know how beautiful flame shells in particular are. It's 2017, a marine biologist who's local to the area, and she had seen a scallop dredger dredging in, in right in um, this side of Plockton, quite close to um, where we are sitting just now, over an, an area where there's known to be a flame shell reef. He's got these gorgeous iron brew coloured tentacles. They're very fragile systems and yet really, really important. So myself and a few colleagues, we managed to get together a few days later. When we first dived down, um, we were expecting to see, uh, a, well, hoping to see a healthy flame shell reef. Having dived it many times before, you know full well how many species rely on it and depend on it and live in it, live on it, feed in it. It was quite, quite distressing. It was utterly dis destroyed. Broken and dead crabs, starfish with multiple arms m missing. But it's the flame shells in particular. To see flame shell reefs lying in their tens of thousands, dead, dying on the bottom, crushed, the shells are broken, the flesh is all hanging out. We came up pretty, pretty quiet, but also in a weird way relieved that we'd found it and that we could, we had the footage that we thought might be there and, and put it put out there and hopefully encourage the government to, to do something about it. It's one of the things that makes fishermen being nice. The weather, the seasons, and definitely sunrises like that kind of make it worth it. Oh, cheeso. Here we go. All my family was at the fishing. My uh, dad's two brothers and my dad were fishing, and on my mum's side, her brothers were all fishing. I worked on scallop dredgers, prawn trawlers. Seal fishing is my preference. I wouldn't really do any of the other types of fishing now. I find it a lot more uh, palatable to do. When I was younger, I was working on trawlers. I'm pretty sure I got fired off one of the trawlers I was working on because I was running around trying to save all the fish. Um, you see a lot of conger eels and skate and stuff like that. Fish that'll survive, even being in the trawl, but you have to get it off the deck quite quickly. And uh, you're meant to be there shoveling prawns and tailing prawns. I mean, I can understand for, for the skipper of these boats, seeing an idiot like me running around trying to save fish um, while he's trying to pay his mortgage and get a wage in for the boys, bad weather coming, all the rest of it. But, um, yeah, it wasn't the job for me.
fishing's still poor. Weather's not great. We've got a nice sunrise though. Small constellation, but you've got to look on the bright side. Life's too short to whinge the whole way through it. So you get, get buried prawns and non-buried prawns. You can see these, is, these, are, these are eggs on the prawns. So we tend to try and throw these ones back. There's no law about it, but these are all potential prawns. And that aspect, keel fishing, is definitely far more sustainable than trawling. The, the net has a set of trawl doors, heavy metal doors, which pull the, the sides of the net apart. And often the trawl doors are skimming the seabed. And if you get places where the trawlers are going round and round and round, like as happens in here, trawling is very similar to harrowing a field, I would argue. The first pass of the harrows, you just notice the grass flattened a little. The second pass of the harrows, they've maybe pulled out some moss and so on and so forth. But as the farmer goes round and round with the harrows, eventually he turns the field to a, a tilth with nothing living on the surface. There may be places where it's more appropriate to plow the seabed than others. But at the moment, the management says you can plow anything you can get your plow on. <laughs> As a public, we have to ask, do we want all of our seabed to be plowed? ecosystem is things like merle, so merle, merle is a type of corally seaweed, then the merle grows at something like a millimetre a year. So once the merle gets ground into something that looks like coarse sand, then it could be hundreds of years, many hundreds of years before that ecosystem can recover. So it turns out that these merle beds is the nursery ground for, for so many species. We shouldn't be dredging for scallops on merrow beds because we're actually undermining the scallop fishery by removing the scallop nursery grounds. And the same is true with prawn trawling. That then there's nowhere for the fish, for the juvenile fish to live. We see almost no fish around here now. A few juvenile cod maybe. That's about it. Whereas if you look at the charts, the, the paper charts, the maps of the seabed in this area that were made 50 and 80 years ago, they've got places on them named after the fish that used to be found there. So there's places on the chart called the Haddy Bank, but yet there's no Haddy here. So this is a cod, it's about as big a cod as we see, and he'll go back alive. If there was less trawling and more keel fishing in here, then we would see things like cod recovery. I mean, we'd like to see recovery of, of all of the species that once lived in here. Whether or not that's possible, I don't know. This is where I started most of my working life. Um, this is Kyle of Kalsh Pier. It's a very industrial place. It's always been an industrial place. When I was started fishing, there was quite a fleet in here, especially when it opened to trawling each year. So this whole edge of the pier would be chocker with, with boats of all shapes and sizes. It's quite a different place now than it was. It was once a lot more hustle bustle, nets getting stretched out and mended, forklifts zooming around. 
at break time there would be a stream of blue boiler suits streaming out the door of the factory all heading up to the shops and now now you're hard pushed to spot a fisherman over here behind me is is the old kyle seafoods is, is my dad's prawn processing factory most of the local boats would be landing into there so this is the old yard where the forklifts would have worked and then the prawns would make their way into the the actual factory itself and around all the tables would be prawn packers, mostly girls, but there was a few boys doing the job too. The sheer volume of prawns that would come through here, even in a week, and 50 odd people running around in forklifts and very smelly overalls. Um, it was a lot of smelly people working here. <laughs> it could be quite impressive in the summer. And then they'd have these huge walk-in freezers here. And you could have two or three guys working in here at minus 17. Literally, some days in their t-shirts, just throwing boxes of prawns around, they'd be working that hard. My dad had a fish packing facility and then when the fish became more scarce they moved on to packing shellfish and then eventually it was just prawn and eventually there wasn't enough prawn coming in and the market was too volatile and the place folded. As we've worked our way down the food chain um, things have had to change and yeah I would say this is another victim of that change. It's a bit sad to see this place like this I mean there's a there's a lot of jobs that are no longer here and that means that the community itself has declined because there would have been millions of pounds coming through here, getting spent in the local shops, renting houses, and the decline affects everybody on the West Coast. It's interesting because I've read some of the arguments for and against that were argued in the 1880s when they talked about bringing the three mile limit in in the first place. And uh, even those who were against the three mile limit at the time, who were all for sort of unbridled capitalism and, and the survival of the fittest, that kind of stuff, even those guys, I think they would weep if they'd seen what had happened now. They convinced each other in the 1880s that there was so much damage being caused by trawling and so much degradation of the environment, decline of fish stocks and gear conflict that they should ban trawling. And that was in the days when trawling was done with sailing boats. I mean, there was once a hugely thriving ecosystem and it was so bountiful that you could harvest vast quantities every year and not make a dent in it. But unfortunately, the harvests got more and more vast until we started making a dent in it. And then when we started making a dent in it, we didn't stop. We couldn't have cleaned it out anymore had we tried. I'm kind of born and bred West Coaster, I love the sea, I always have. I was brought up beside the sea and spent a lot of time on boats my whole life. It's heartbreaking for me to think that we can accept the degradation in our inshore habitat when clearly we don't need to and there are better ways of managing it for everybody. My name's Ailsa McClellan, um, I've got a background in marine science and I've worked in inshore fisheries management for about 18 years. Currently, we've got an oyster farm and are looking to diversify into seaweed. People have eaten it on the coast of Ireland and Scotland all through time. It grows abundantly and really quickly in our coastal waters. The kelp habitat is one of the most biodiverse habitats on the planet. It's comparable with a rainforest. Invertebrates, eh, which in turn feed fin fish, shellfish, birds, mammals like seals and otters, and of course, us humans as well. All of these areas just support so much life. We've still got healthy kelp up in Scotland and we need to be protecting that. It would be mad to assume that towing a heavy metal dredge over any of these habitats wasn't going to have a degrading effect on it. And we have lost the fin fish fishery largely in the inshore, to, to a massive extent. We've fished these seas for thousands of years, but it's only in the last few decades that we've pushed the fisheries to the absolute limit. We really need to separate out the two types of fishery to manage them properly. If we had a three mile limit back, we could still have vibrant fisheries and therefore vibrant coastal communities within the three miles. We could have creeling, diving, rod and line fisheries, 
it is really important that things are done in a fair way so that employment opportunities aren't lost. But with proper fisheries management, we should have more vibrant fisheries, not less. We've all got a stake in the sea. It belongs to all of us, and it's up to all of us to put pressure on governments to get some limits back in place so that we can protect the fisheries that are left and get recovery of some of the stocks that we have lost in the past few decades. I spend a lot of time down the beach with Max and Cami. Uh, we, we, we go down as often as we can, really. Um, after school, quite often, we'll head down to some of the little beaches nearby. Max already talking about diving. He speaks about Daddy being a diver when he's at school, and I'm definitely interested in helping him learn when he's older. We've got some other bits and bobs to show you here. So did you see this guy properly? He's a beautiful colour, isn't he? This one's called a, an edible urchin. It does look like an eyeball, doesn't it? Yeah. That's actually his mouth in there. Isn't that cool? I like those. Oh, you like the starfish, yeah. Well, these ones are one of my favourites. I'll just get him out of the water for a minute. He'll be okay for a second. If I get him in the light, look how beautiful he is. Yeah, stroke him. You can give him a tickle. Nice and gentle like that. Well done. Do you want to hold one? Put your hand out flat. Pop him on your hands. Whoa. There you go. It looks like putting lobes of soaking on to me. On each of these arms, he's got loads and loads of little suckers. And he, that's how he sticks down in the, on the seabed when he's out in the sea. Do you think we should put him back in the water? Yeah. Let's put him back down here. If humans as a species continue to damage the environment like we're doing just now, then we will see you know, a, a big change in the number of animals, the number of species, the, the habitats that are available to these animals. I want my boys to be able to dive uh, when they're older and see the same things that I'm seeing. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to think that my boys might live to see a time when the, the seas are barren or close to it. So well, we're hoping to move into this thing. My last uh, temporary accommodation was more temporary than I'd hoped. I've been living on the croft here for well, quite a few years now. Unfortunately, the original caravan I got is uh, barely habitable. So this place is going to have to do this. Now for the next wee while until we get the house built. If my grandfather and father had been builders, they'd probably know what I was doing. But no, they condemned me to life at sea instead. There's a little pipe cutter, I think it's at the door. Can you get it for me? You know the wee thing, I mean the wee black. Okay, halfway there boys, I think there'll be cheese and toast yet. If you, if you compare what's going on in land reform with what's going on in fisheries, basically they want rid of the people in order to put sheep on the land. And the, the same thing really happened in inshore fishing, in that after industrial fisheries were invented, the smaller scale fisheries, who were often just fishing for their own livelihoods, they were seen to be um, some kind of throwback to the past. And because trawlers and, and, and larger fishing vessels could catch more using less men, they were seen to be more efficient and therefore they should really have more right, they were more profitable. But what we're really seeing now is that the, the real profit that we should be getting from fisheries is employment and return to local communities. And these large industrial fishing vessels and fishing interests do the opposite of that. They often take away and deprive communities of their incomes and their ability to work their own resource base. Years worth of crap. Mind your there. French. Oh. Jump around there and pull that off, please. Yeah. This is where the gas goes on, and I don't have any kind of an adapter. Nothing in there. Uh, cheese sandwiches for lunch today, I think. 
just as well I didn't get soup. In the fishing industry, almost every male that preceded me and my family on both my mother and father's side was at the fishing. Certainly we're going back at least three generations in, in this community. I did much, much the same as, as my son now in the sense that I, I fished on holidays, I washed creels. You know, he's got this background of fishing in his heritage, but to some degree I, I hope he doesn't go fishing. And I hope if he does go fishing, then we've done something with the fishing industry to make it better than it is now. Otherwise he's inheriting a, a, a dying industry and that's a, a hellish thing to condemn someone to, I think. I'm going to end up working a fishing boat at one point or another, maybe not forever, maybe not for a small life, but at some point I'm probably going to. My dad is a fisherman and fishermen, no matter how they fish or where they fish, they're all going to be judged by history in the same light. And I know it's sad and I know it's probably not fair. I hope that history looks back and says, well, they did, they did all right, they tried their best and they did it sustainably. It's almost safe enough to eat something. Yeah, shouldn't you? And this is stereotype the Highlanders are less civilized. I hope you like chunky cheese, that's all I can say. No, having this moving chair makes me feel like I'm back at sea again. <laughs> <laughs> It's not it's back and forth. Nothing to do with your amazing <laughs> way. Enjoy your skills, does it? No. So this is the village of Plockton on the west coast. It's on the shores of Loch Carran. The, the old village, or the main village that was created back in the day, is, is a long street of houses on the edge of the water of a very sheltered bay. Unusually for these very small highland villages, there's a, a railway. Back in the day, the original idea was that they would be exporting large quantities of fish out of here. At the time, they were moving people from inland down towards the coast, trying to promote the fishing industry, especially the herring industry that was taking off at the time. And so they built harbours and villages up and down the west coast of Scotland. Portree, Plockton, Ullapool. There was a lot of towns in the highlands that were built to accommodate the, the population moving from inland, getting dispossessed of their crofts and their agricultural holdings. It doesn't have much of a fishing industry here now. So everybody had to move their gear or yes. not fish where they would have liked to or otherwise been able to fish for fear of losing their gear. The problem with the gear is far up the shore, you know, up on the hard, the, the way is you can. We're too scared to put them out there because we lose them. Yeah. I'm just going to update you on what the crack is with the NSM pilot at the moment. If it goes ahead, we've got until April next year to form a local management committee, which has to have trawlers on it, NGOs on it, environmental groups on it, Marine Scotland on it, and a representative from each community. And then that management group makes the rules for the pilot area. In order to comply with our end of the bargain, we have to agree to nobody working more than 1,600 keels. And an increase in minimum landing size. Yeah, yeah, of course, yes, yeah. yeah. So, is there anyone else got any other issues they'd like to raise while we're here, or any questions? Or... Don't mention Brexit. <laughs> 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 You're at the wrong meeting, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I was trawling for about 10 years. From what would it be, about 1985 until 1996. Well, and I, I, bought the, I bought the trawler because, well, they, they decided to do away with the three mile limit. So I thought it would be a better opportunity to make more money, but, um, which I did, of course. So, but I, I just started reading more about the actual environmental damage that the trawl was doing, speaking to some of my friends who were diving, and they were telling me what damage was being done to the seabed and to creatures on the seabed. And I, I can see where, when, you, when you haul the trawl right up, You've got a huge bycatch of small fish, you know, little crabs, sea urchins, ontonians. So I did tell, I did tell quails, as I say, not deliberately, but there was an attitude amongst the prawn, the, the mobile fleet, that any quails in those trawl areas were considered to be fair game. Fisheries management is the cause of much of the gear conflict that we see. I think the trawlers have been pressurised probably more than anybody else. The, the big boats that come around here from the east coast, they push the smaller trawlers inshore, which push the smaller trawlers again inshore. And then when the really smallest trawlers get inshore, they have to meet the creel guys. 
and, uh, and we're all fighting over the same space. So I think, I think the smallest of the trawlers have been squeezed the hardest and have probably got the, the worst of, it, of all the fishermen. For most of these guys, they literally don't have a choice. They're, they try to pay their mortgages. If they don't pay their mortgages, they, they don't have a house or a job. So um, yeah, most of them are just doing what they can. Most of them are, are not breaking the law. Even if, even if we find their method of fishing abhorrent for whatever reason, they're still doing what fisheries management says is the way they should be fishing. I think the problem doesn't so much lie with trawlers or dredgers, it lies with fisheries management. <laughs> right, come over here a minute, boys. Right, shall we have a look under this rock? We do. Just gently lift it up. Max, what's this? A crab. It's a teeny tiny little crab. He is tiny. This is his house, this is where he lives. Have you given him a name yet? No. Uh, crabby. Pinchy, I like Pinchy. Pincher. Pincher, the Pinchy Crab. In 2017. The strange thing about this whole circumstance is that the dredger, uh, he was perfectly legal, he was perfectly able to come into Loch Caron, perfectly legally put down his dredges and dredge the area despite there being a flame shell reef there. You know, we weren't annoyed at him. He was just doing what dredgers do, which is trying to find scallops. And that's the, the most frustrating thing about this, I suppose, is that it took someone to come in and, and damage that area for us to then manage to get it protected. MPAs are a fantastic idea in principle, um, but let's be honest, even the ones we've got aren't being properly policed. You know, folk are still able to come in and, and illegally dredge, for instance, and unless the government are able to, to put something more, you know, more enforcement in place to actually look after the areas we've got and, and further protect these areas, then, then kind of like, what's the point? They're just a tiny proportion of the, the coastline, you know, they're half a loch here, they're a section of a loch there. Yeah, it's far too little, just far too little. Imagine a, a limit around the whole of the coastline, you know, Scotland's got a huge coastline. It's bigger than the coastline of the rest of the UK put together. Um, and if that whole area was, was protected, it would just be a massive step forward. doubt about it that fisheries management has been a colossal cock up, um, a wasted opportunity and uh, I often think if we, you know, if we had a blank slate, how would we do it? It certainly wouldn't be like it's done now. The problem is we don't have a blank slate and now we've got hundreds of men whose jobs and mortgages rely on things not changing too dramatically, too suddenly. And that's my biggest concern. I think we have to start with the premise that the resource which is closest to a community to some degree belongs to that community more than say it belongs to somebody from a faraway place that doesn't live there. And there's an incentive to manage a fishery properly if it's exploited by, by local people. Let's just say we manage to successfully recover the fish who gets to fish them? Because it's not necessarily the people that take the fall now and, and, and take the losses now that, that will get to fish them. The right to fish is based on ownership of quota. And because there's no fish here, nobody owns the quota. So we could go to great lengths, put, put some fishermen out of work, tie up the trawlers, pay a great pain, only for someone else to come round from the east coast in a big pelagic boat and clean the place out in a day. We need quite a lot of things to change, not just the trawling. The whole of inshore fisheries management needs to change. That's, that's the crux of it. It's not the trawlermen's fault, it's not the fishermen's fault, it's the fisheries management fault. They've designed a system whereby trawlers and crewmen have to compete for the same thing. They've designed a system whereby only those who have got quota can catch the fish. There's so much absurdity in the way they've designed fisheries management that personally I find it quite frustrating that, that the instinct the public have just to blame the fishermen for the state of fishing because 
most fishermen don't have any role in fisheries management. They don't, they don't get to decide what to catch and how to catch it and what's legal and what's not legal. That's all done at the government level. And really that's, that's where future fisheries management has to come from. Not the fishermen, but the government.